Thank you. It, it's great to be here. Um, I have to admit, when I when I received the invitation uh, to come speak at this um, this gathering, and I looked through the uh, the lineup of designers and artists, I uh, I thought to myself, do they have the right guy? Am I, uh, do I have anything to say about about any of this, especially to artists and designers? And um, the topic, culture clash, is, uh, is something that I thought about. And actually, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my whole career has been defined both by coming to terms with uh, my own culture shock as an Arab American, and also in the culture shock of trying to, uh, to bridge the divide between the Middle East, the Arab world, uh, and the West. Um, looking back on one's career, I've been at it for 30 years now, you start to, uh, to see your work in terms of periods. And I think I have very, three very distinct periods of my career. Um, I started out actually uh, intending to, uh, to go to foreign service school and to be a diplomat. And in my mind, in my young mind, as an American diplomat, I thought that was a great way to serve as some kind of bridge between the homeland that my family came from and the world that I grew up in. And actually at that time, in the 1960s, when I was growing up in South Philadelphia, uh, there were very few visual rep representations of the Arab world for me to draw upon. You didn't see the Arab world de depicted in film or in television, really in, in any way, except maybe if you count Lawrence of Arabia. There was nothing else out there. And um, as a kid, as a little boy, I remember going to the Greek Orthodox Church, the Syrian Orthodox Church on the corner, and standing in front of the icons, not because I was particularly religious, but because I could look in the background of what was happening with the saints or whatever and see what the trees look like, what the landscape look like, what the people look like, what the faces look like. And it really wasn't until uh, the mid-1960s and the Six-Day War and later the war in 72 and later the Lebanese Civil War that images from the Arab world started to, to reach my world. And they were profoundly different than the world that I that I understood from my family and from my grandparents. And this was a real culture shock. Because to me, I would, what I was seeing on, an, and on television and in news magazines was the reality of what was really happening. And it reduced, in my own mind, the world that my family talked about, the world of community, the world of the Arab family, the world of, of, uh, of Lebanon and Syria and Palestine, reduced it to some sort of myth. I went to college in Berkeley, California, and I had a second culture shock there. Um, I always thought the best way to explain what was happening in our part of the world and explain our perspective was through words and was through the intellect. Uh, and so I studied uh, international relations and history for four years. And one day in the, uh, in the spring of my senior year, I came across a book which was a book of photography. It was rather new at the time. It was called Nicaragua by Susan Mizellas. And it was a picture story book of 100 images of very intimate photojournalism of the revolution that overthrew the Sandinista regime. I was never particularly interested in Latin America. But as I looked through this book, I realized that it spoke to me more loudly than any newspaper article I had ever read about what was happening in that revolution. It spoke to me more intimately about what the people were about there, what they looked like. And I realized that in this book, there was, a tr there was another language going on. It was a visual language. And I wondered at the same time why there were no books like this coming out of Palestine, why there were no books like this coming out of Lebanon. So I resolved actually, before going on to graduate school, to actually travel to Lebanon and to see the war firsthand and to become a photojournalist. So I began working for the Associated Press and the United Press International taking news pictures. We can start the pictures. Um, photographs have a different language. And they're about showing. They're about not telling. And 
I tried through my photography to look beyond the war, to look at the humanity of the people there. Um, I'm going to show you a film at the end of my talk, which revisits this period, and which talks about the role of a photojournalist in telling a visual story to the world, also about the role of photography in wartime, and also about the relationship of the photographer to the subjects. Because while photography is an astonishing medium, it's a very limited medium. It has no sound, it has no voice. It should actually, in its purest form, exist beyond explanation. The explanation should take place on a, on a visual level. I traveled to Beirut. I stayed there on and off for 10 years throughout the war, living on both sides of the city and, and traveling the, the country from north to south. But after 10 years, it sort of had become enough. And as I said, looking back on my career, I can see that it has, has progressed in 10-year in increments. Okay, we can stop those. So I went back to the United States after having lived in Lebanon, having gotten to know the Arab world firsthand, uh, having come to adopt Lebanon as my country and Beirut as my country and Palestine as my cause. I came back to the United States because after 10 years of exposure to that kind of warfare and that kind of uh, brutality, it just becomes too much if you have any humanity at all. And photographers tend to go two routes. After 10 years in a war zone, generally you become a war junkie. And my friends would travel from war zone to war zone. So they would leave Lebanon to go to the Iran-Iraq war, to go down to Latin America, to, to travel the world wherever there was violence. But for me, the object of my work wasn't really about talking about violence. And though it was talking about the news, what I tried to do in my work was uh, convey the humanity of the people in the news. I went back to the United States, and as I said, it was profound culture shock, because that whole world that I lived in was not only a thousand miles away, it was a universe away. And it simply disappeared when I was in America. And it was only understood, at that time there weren't a lot of films coming out from the Arab world reaching America. And so it existed only in the headlines, only in the sort of very obscene little news briefs that you would read in Time and Newsweek. And to me, it was almost um, a cultural war crime, what the media was doing in terms of informing Americans about what the Arab world was. Uh, a lot of times in one's career, you go from one stage to one, another stage which is completely different, and that's what I did. And over the next 10 years, I began working for a publication called Aramco World. It's now it's called Saudi Aramco World, and it's kind of a National geographic -y kind of magazine of arts and culture and literature of the Arab world. And I did a lot of stories for them. The ones that I'm most proud of, though, were a series on Arab Americans, on geniuses, and people that I defined as geniuses, that maybe uh, weren't commonly looked upon as what we consider a genius. And the thing that, that was interesting to me was whether any part of their Arab heritage, whether any part of their background or their culture impacted their work. And so that was really the bottom line question that, uh, that I looked for when I went to see these people. And I'll tell you about three of them. One was um, a fellow named Sam Malouf. When I went to see him, he was in his, in his 80s. He was uh, the son of Lebanese immigrants. He grew up in California. On the surface of it, you would find nothing really Arab about him, uh, only his, you know, his physical presence. Uh, and his work on the surface seemed to have nothing to do with the Arab world. He was America's most highly honored hardwood craftsman. He designed uh, a chair called the Malouf Rocker, which um, there's copies of the Malouf Rocker in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Vatican Museum. He's the only living artist whose work is included in the White House collection. Um, absolutely astonishing craftsman. Um, and when I went to see him and I went to talk to him about his work, I asked him how he got started. And he, he got started actually carving little pieces of wood in his mother's kitchen and making for her um, kitchen utensils out of wood. 
and he grew, he started then making chairs and he refined these chairs over and over and over again in the course of years. And what he spoke to me about in terms of his background and his heritage and how it informed what he did in terms of soul. And the one thing that he taught me was that any work of art that has life uh, has that life because it's been touched by human hands and it's been cared for by a human. And the amount of time that you spend on a piece, the amount of yourself that you invest in that piece, whatever art worth that is, is reflected in, a pe in the piece itself. And if you're attuned to that, you can feel the difference between a handmade chair as opposed to one that's made in a factory. They might have the same specifications, but the fact that somebody sat for hours sanding, the fact that somebody sat for hours crafting and molding and refining is reflected in the beauty of the chair. Mm, another fellow I met, completely different animal, was a guy named Dick Dale, who is known as the king of the surf guitar. He's the man who invented surf music, electric surf mu music, uh, there's a Fender Stratocaster guitar named after him called the Dick Dale Special. His real name is Mansour, and his family came from Lebanon at the turn of the century. He grew up playing oud in Dimbaki, and when the electric guitar was invented, he was one of the first adopters of the electric guitar. And his most famous song is called Miserlu. It's best known as the theme to Pulp Fiction, and I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times. What he did was he fused Arabic music and he electrified it and he sped up the beat. And he created one of the great surf tune classics, a song which is infectious because of its roots in the Arab world, in the Ottoman Empire actually at that time, and its California vibrancy and the electricity that, that it brings to that music. So I worked on that period for, for quite a while and then in my last period, I began, I came back to the Middle East and my partner, Maryam Shaheen, and I began making a series of documentary films for Al Jazeera English for a series called Witness. Um, Witness documentaries are on the surface of them, surface, films about big events. They're films that take place in everywhere from the slums of Karachi to Beirut to uh, just sort of the biggest political landscapes of the day. But really what they are at heart is their personal stu studies of individuals. And I realize that another, another way that I've been able to navigate this world of culture shock, especially as a reporter, covering something which is much bigger than any reporter can cover a war, whether it's the Iran-Iraqi war or whether it's the Lebanese civil war uh, or whether it's Afghanistan. I always felt in the middle of these situations that I really didn't understand what was happening in front of me. It was all too big, it was all too complex, it was all too secretive. And the way I could explain it best of all to other people was to find the simplest human stories and to tell the story of a person and through that person, tell the story of the, the wider conflict. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of them. The first film that I worked on was called The Gaza Fixer. No, 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 not those. The Gaza Fixer was one of my f the first stories that I ever did. Uh, it was for Al Jazeera English. It happened at a time when I was actually still, can we slow it down? When I was still working for the New York Times. And I decided I wanted to, that when you're making a film, when you're telling a story, it's best to start with, with what's close to home. So I began my, really, what I consider my first film with the story of my driver. And I think that uh, drivers and fixers are sort of the, the unknown heroes of the news business. There's someone no one pays attention to, but they're their local person. 
that navigates that culture shock between a foreign correspondent and the country that they're covering. M my fixer was named Ra'ed, and he was my friend as well. Um, I began making a story just about our day-to-day -day lives, about how we would drive and cover news stories about the, the, the culture of the news business in, in Gaza, where there were only really two steady lines of work, the news business and the gun business, the violence business. And it began as a really simple story about a driver and his reporter. And in the middle of the story, one night when I was waiting for Rod to come pick me up, out of nowhere, the Israelis la launched a salvo of 36 artillery shells into the compound of Ra'ad's family's house. And when the first shells landed, some people were wounded, everyone was dazed, and they ran out into the alleyway to take shelter. And then a second salvo came, and it killed 18 members of his family, and it wounded 36 others. And the film went from being the simple story of a fixer to the chronicle of a tragedy, and the chronicle of how a person in Gaza deals with that kind of tragedy in their life, and also how they move on. And it's also about what happens when the news cameras go away. Because Ra'id, in the span of a few minutes, went from being a guy that the other reporters wouldn't talk to, that the hotel management often wouldn't want to come into the hotel because he was the driver, he wasn't the correspondent. He went from being sort of a nobody to somebody that everybody wanted to talk to and he was fielding telephone calls and interviews from all around the world. And then everyone went away. And so what happened to his life? So if you ever have a chance to see it, it's, uh, it's on YouTube. It's called The Gaza Fixer. Uh, I've been talking for a long time now, and, and one of the, the key elements of filmmaking is showing and not telling. So I'd like to show you a film that Mariam and I did recently called Beirut Photographer. It was a film which was to mark the anniversary of the Sabra and Shatila massacre, and also the 30th anniversary of the war in Lebanon. Um, Al Jazeera asked me to go back to make a film about that war, but moreover to make a film about my own experience, and to talk about, to talk about what had happened to me and, and how I saw the war. I was very uncomfortable with that idea. I had never been in front of the camera in a film before, and it, it really isn't my way, and it isn't the way most journalists operate. So what I decided to do was to take a stack of photos with me, photos that I had taken 30 years earlier, photos that I hadn't really revisited, that had lived in the back of my closet for the longest time. And I decided to try to track down the faces in these pictures, and to try to understand, first of all, for probably for the first time, what was really happening in those images when I took them at age 22 years old. Because as I said, I, I barely understood what I was seeing. But at the same time, to give voice to the people in the pictures and allow them to tell their stories. Um, so, I'll present to you now uh, Beirut Photographer. Our doorstep 
began painting a darker picture of the Arab world, in which my people were increasingly cast as the enemy. I went to college in Berkeley, California. In 1981, the spring of my senior year, Israeli jets flew into Lebanon and bombed two apartment blocks in West Beirut, killing hundreds of civilians. I was outraged that it was barely reported in U.S. papers. I decided to postpone graduate school to document firsthand a world I had only read about. In November 1981, I arrived in Beirut with two cameras, a few rolls of film, and $75. I had never taken a professional picture. Lebanon was in the middle of the civil war and the front line of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Its capital, Beirut, was the headquarters of the Palestine Liberation Organization and a magnet for revolutionaries from around the world. During my first three years, I documented gun battles, car bombs, airstrikes, and an invasion. I was abducted six times and once placed against a wall for execution. Over the years, the faces in my early photographs have become part of my mental landscape. They haunted my dreams and my nightmares. Three decades after the 1982 Israeli invasion, I'm back in Beirut, searching for the faces of my pictures. But the country has changed so much, I doubt I'll find any of them. When I first got to Beirut, I was astonished to find people walking the street with guns. I had never seen anything like it. I quickly found a job as a stringer taking freelance news pictures for the AP and UPI news organizations. In April 1982, a few months into the job, I was typing at my desk in the Harbor District, but an explosion shook the building. I grabbed my camera and ran downstairs. A man ran towards me carrying a child. A woman was lying in the street, apparently dead, in front of a flower shop. Through the viewfinder, it all seemed removed from reality. It was hard to focus on any one thing. The horror took a while to sink in. When I thought about it later that night, I threw up. Thirty years later, I'm surprised to find the flower shop is still there. I showed Dr. Takush the pictures. He was there that day. Mr. Tuk 
Kush identified the woman lying on the ground as his wife, just as she walked into the flower shop. The question of who that was hung in the air. Ahmed, their son, also thinks she's the woman in the photo. The Tukushas are Lebanese and not affiliated with any political party. The bomb was actually aimed at their neighbor, a Palestinian activist. Beginning in 1948, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians fled to Lebanon when their towns and villages were destroyed by Israel. They brought their war with Israel to Lebanon. When I arrived in 1981, the PLO had transformed its refugee camps in Beirut and South Lebanon into bases from which they waged a guerrilla war to regain their homeland. As a young photographer, I was fascinated by the orphan boys and girls in the refugee camps who formed a military unit called the Ashbal, or Tiger Cubs. In June 1982, Israel launched a summer-long invasion of Lebanon to destroy the PLO. That war changed Lebanon, the Middle East, and me forever. On June 4th, Israeli jets screamed over my head and laid a series of airstrikes on the PLO Arms Depot, located inside Beirut's National Sports Stadium. The explosions were so bright, they blinded my camera's senses. It was the first shot of the 1982 war. Two days later, 80,000 Israeli troops overran South Lebanon, encircled Beirut, and for 79 days, bombed it from the air, sea, and land. It killed 20,000 people and maimed over 100,000. Although I didn't realize the extent of it at the time, the Israeli invasion changed me too. After the war, I went back to the Rune Stadium and found it had become a haven for orphan children, who turned it into a playground. Today the Lebanese have rebuilt their stadium and I've come to see them play their first World Cup qualifying match. But my mind is on the past.
headed to the Dawi refugee camp in North Lebanon. It's my best chance of finding PLO fighters from the 1982 war. The guy eating the apples is Abu Mahmoud. He's an old school military commander who fought the Israelis during the invasion and was one of the few who stayed after the PLO was expelled from Lebanon.
trying to figure out what to do. Out of nowhere, an embedded Israeli photojournalist showed up. He asked me some questions to verify my identity, then arranged for me to be flown by helicopter with injured soldiers to a base in northern Israel. I'll never forget seeing Lebanon from the air, burning. Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982 killed 20,000 people. When I reached Jerusalem, I handed over two rolls of color film to the magazine. Beirut was now surrounded by the Israeli army. I desperately needed to get back. It had become my war. Within days, I sailed from Haifa to Cyprus, then took a special ferry to Lebanon, landing at the port of Junia, north of Beirut, in the dead of night. I crossed the Israeli military cordon, encircling West Beirut, and arrived in a dark, besieged city. All the water was cut off. There was no food in the shops, no electricity. Back at my apartment, I found my sleeping bag and my shortwave radio were gone, distributed to friends who, after two weeks missing, assumed I was dead. My roommate stacked empty wine bottles in the kitchen to make Molotov cocktails when the Israelis arrived. When the news magazine published that week, they ran two of my photos, but they showed Lebanese fighters shooting from the back of the truck, and none of my pictures of the Israeli assault on GA. On top of that, as a thank you, they gave away my assignment. West Beirut was completely cut off from the rest of the world. I continued working without an assignment as bombs rained in from all directions. Hospital wards were overflowing. That summer, combined Palestinian and Lebanese forces repulsed several major ground assaults, and its people withstood 79 days of Israeli airstrikes and artillery bombardments. I'd never seen so many dead bodies. Lebanon's leading newspaper, Al Nahar, Estimated 5,000 people were killed in Beirut alone, and tens of thousands were wounded. The war ended in August, when the U.S. mediated an exit of 14,000 PLO fighters in exchange for an agreement the Israelis would not enter West Beirut. Bashir Jamayil, head of the right-wing Lebanese forces, was elected president of Lebanon, and on August 30th, Arafat and the PLO army sailed out of West Beirut. Before the war, I spent a lot of time photographing in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. Two weeks after the PLO left Beirut, Bashir Jamayu was assassinated. The Israelis and the right-wing Lebanese allies blamed the Palestinians, which turned out to be false. Breaking the truce, the Israelis stormed West Beirut and allowed murderous squads of Lebanese militiamen into Sabra and Shatila to butcher men, women, and children for three long days and nights. Thirty years later, Sabra and Shatila remain among the most notorious slaughters in the history of the modern Middle East. This simple memorial pays homage to the thousands of victims who died or disappeared that day. Um Hussein Burji was photographed by my colleague, Ali Hassan Salman. 
a photo taken earlier that day, captures her shortly after finding her three murdered sons and her husband. She visits their gravesite every Friday. I'm At first, Ibn Hussein didn't know who the gunmen were. For years, I regretted not having been in Sabra and Shatila that day. But speaking to Umm Hussein, I realized that maybe I've been lucky not having to live with those images burned in my mind. The fall of the Dawi camp in 1983 broke Palestinian power in Lebanon. I watched the position change from the country's dominant power broker to a marginalized, impoverished community.
وإلي نفس الفترة هاي 27 سنة أنا ما عاد شفت حدا منهم يعني هذول أصحاب فما عرفت حالي بدي أفرح بالصورة أو بدي أحزن Israelis 
drunk with power, decided to stay and subjugate South Lebanon, just as they had done in the West Bank and Gaza. But they underestimated the Lebanese, who excelled in the art of guerrilla warfare. Beginning in 1983, a coalition of Lebanese political groups, including Amal and Hezbollah, launched a resistance campaign that by the year 2000 drove the Israelis completely out of South Lebanon. Hezbollah dominates Lebanon's political landscape today. At the dawn of this era, I came to know a group of teenage gunmen living in Shia, arguably the most dangerous neighborhood in the most dangerous city in the world. They ranged in age from 14 to 24 years old and called themselves the Smurfs. They were perpetrators and victims in a war that defined our generation. Getting permission to film Amal and Hezbollah fighters, even old ones, is difficult. Days into the process, I was asked to meet Jihad Hussein in a cafe deep in the southern suburbs. He arrived with an entourage. A whisper told me that he was the brother of Hassan Nasrallah, the powerful leader of Hezbollah. Jihad looked at my photos carefully. He recognized places and faces, and after 15 minutes gave me his permission to work. The teenage unit I spent the most time with was commanded by a 24-year-old named Ali Shamas, who I knew as Castro. Today, he and his wife own a woman's clothing shop.
لما نجيب مسافات بعيدة يعني تحكي بالكبر بكيلو متر هيك على الأكيد يعني كنا على كيلو متر عرفت كيف مهمس فيها In February 1984, I photographed Amal paddling the Lebanese army for control of West Beirut. At the front line, Castro and the Smurfs fought to gain control of a church called Marmchaya that commanded a strategic intersection in the divided city. We almost died there. It was cathartic to see the people in my photographs living their lives outside the frame. 